Welcome to the Natasha Helfer Podcast. To help keep this podcast going, please consider donating at natashahelfer.com and share this episode. You can find Natasha on Facebook at Natasha Helfer, LCMFT, CSTS, and at Natasha Helfer MFT on Instagram and TikTok. You can find all her cool resources at natashahelfer.com. The intro and outro music for this episode is by Otter Creek. This podcast was edited by Ashley Pacini. Hello, everybody. I'm Natasha Helfer. I'm a relational and sex therapist, and this is my podcast where we try to attack shame, get healthier through education, stories, relationships. And today I'm just thrilled to have David Hayward, the naked pastor. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> this is kind of, sorry, it's kind of badass is all I'm going to say. <laughs> it's your name. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I got to meet you at Affirmation, which is a kind of a conference that is held for LDS slash Mormon folks here in Utah, especially LGBTQ plus folks mm-hmm. as far as supporting them. And they had you as one of their keynote speakers. So I, that was really a treat to see you speak, but I've been following your work for many, many years, really loving it. So it's Thank you. kind of a treat to fangirl a little bit and get to meet you yeah. and to get to talk to you a little. So awesome. Welcome and to the show. Thank you. And thanks for having me on your show. And hello, everybody. Uh, that was a lot of fun in Kansas, uh, Kansas City, Salt Lake City. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, I had a lot of fun there and meeting all kinds of people. It was um, one of the, I think it was the first event since COVID really struck that I'd been at. So it was really cool to be around a bunch of people that you know, we're affirming. (laughs) Yes. Right. Totally awesome. I love that conference. It's, um, it's getting more and more well-known. It's their international conference and they have people that come in from South America and just like uh, lots of cool things. So yeah, shout out for affirmation for sure. And yeah, so let's get, uh, and I hope those of you who are listening live, uh, feel free to ask questions or make comments and I'll try to keep track of that. But I'd love to start just kind of with your personal story as much as you're willing to share as far as how, you know, how, how and where you grew up, what religious background you come from, how you became a pastor. Um, mm-hmm. We start there. Yeah. Um, so I grew up around Toronto, uh, Canada. So I'm, I'm Canadian. I'm in Canada now. I'm on the East Coast of Canada, however, but uh, three time zones away from you. And um, I grew up in a pretty Christian home. My mom and dad were born again at a a Billy Graham crusade in Toronto. And uh, I'm I'm the oldest of five kids. So we were, you know, in and around church all the time. Not not any one certain denomination. Uh, We moved a lot. So we just went to the whatever church was convenient. But we did end up in a Baptist church and then a Pentecostal church. I went to a Pentecostal Bible college that's in, in the States. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where I met my wife, uh, who's American. Um, and from there, I went to Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary in Boston, got my master's in New Testament, Greek, Hebrew, you know, all the stuff. Um, long story short, I was working towards my PhD in New Testament. I wanted to be a New Testament scholar. And we got pregnant, and that sort of derailed us. I ended up in the ministry uh, in the Presbyterian Church in Canada and ended up serving the church as a pastor for about uh, 30 years and uh, left the ministry in 2010. And I'd been blogging on Naked Pastor for about five years to that point. And uh, I decided to try to make a go uh, making Naked Pastor a full-time gig. And it worked out. So that's what I've been doing ever since. That's amazing. Yeah, that's that's yeah. really that's really great. So several denominations that were influencing you, Pentecostal mm-hmm. definitely kind of considered high demand religion. Yes. Uh, Southern Baptist, definitely conservative, right? So all of those kinds of things. So walk us through kind of your your spiritual maybe journey. What was it like to be a minister of a congregation, pastor of a congregation? What kinds of maybe things were beneficial about that? Well, how did you see that being helpful to people? And then also maybe what, what started being some of your concerns mm-hmm. as you maybe had to sit with, 
you know, your religious beliefs or standards and then kind of maybe some values development that you were going through? Yeah, so your observation that uh, high high commitment kind of um, churches, it's it's strange. Why did I always gravitate towards that? You know, that's one of my big questions. And I know that's a question that a lot of us ask ourselves that um, when we when we leave the church, like so many people are doing, um, they many of us miss the community aspect of it, even though we know it wasn't good for us uh, 100%. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's a real vexing question for a lot of people. But it's not unusual, is it? And I'm sure you've seen this a lot where somebody might leave an abusive relationship, for example, and still miss the relationships or some aspects of it. And yeah. uh, so that's... Families, the families yeah. even. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. So... Mm -hmm. I, even though I, I call myself my own ecumenical movement, because I've been in, in so many churches and everything. I was baptized as a baby, as an Anglican and so on, which is the U.S. Episcopal equivalent. And, you know, Baptist, Pentecostal, independent, went to Catholic. I had a Catholic spiritual director. I got ordained as a Presbyterian minister. I ended up in the Vineyard Church. I ended up planning an independent church, you know, all that kind of thing. I, and I tended to gravitate towards uh, churches where I felt the freedom to be myself. I wasn't just looking for a flock of sheep to preach at every week. I was I was looking for a community where I felt I could also grow, and as a as a person and spiritually. So um, I was lucky that way. I, I I think me growing up not feeling committed to any one denomination gave me the freedom to find what suited me at the time. So, you know, I know a lot of people, they've been in the Baptist church their whole lives and endeavor to stay or Presbyterian or whatever it is, you know, but I, I didn't feel any loyalty to any one denomination. And I ended up just in congregations where we could grow together. And, and so the last denomination or movement I ended up in was the vineyard and it was great you know until I felt I found the edge of the box and mm -hmm. I felt I couldn't grow anymore where I was and uh, you know the congregation and I came to a mutual agreement that I would go my way and they would go theirs I call it an amicable divorce and uh, we went our separate ways and um, so you know it for for the most part I and enjoyed being a part of the church and, uh, and you know, felt like I was doing a good job as a pastor and everything. Well, on the other hand, I really struggled with church and the system and the institution and all the baggage that came with that and uh, systemic issues that came with that and being a part of that system. Um, so it was a bittersweet experience for me. But in 2010, um, it, it became too, uh, what do you call that, constrictive for me. And okay. I, I thought I had, to, I had to, to leave in order to be able to grow and to be my authentic self. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe that's where we can start is like yeah. what part of kind of religious messaging were, and we can get detailed, you know, like things like, yeah. oh, you know, growing up with like this idea that maybe there's a there's an all-powerful being who cares about me you know maybe that was a helpful thing but yeah you know so maybe you can talk about some of the things that drew you to the theology but then maybe what were some also some of the problems like why did you start feeling constricted or I've also kind of heard you use the word hypocrisy quite a bit right so why what mm -hmm. were what were the tensions right that you were starting to kind of theologically wrestle with well, um, there's a word I throw around quite a bit called deconstruction, and I use that word. I sort of borrowed that word from the philosophical world um, that, um, I, and I use it to describe the process of questioning our beliefs and questioning everything about our beliefs and our whole faith and religion and church and everything. And so, um, you know, up until the point, like when I was going through Bible college and all that kind of thing, and 
seminary, everything was fine. Um, and I was a very much a student of the Bible. Like I said, I was studying the original languages, Greek and Hebrew and everything. But it was on my graduation day from seminary when I actually, it dawned on me, maybe the scriptures weren't inspired. Like maybe they just didn't drop out of heaven, fully formed and divine. And it, that was very, very unsettling for me because uh, the Bible was the foundation upon which all my beliefs were built. And, and that was sort of pulled and everything started shaking. I compare it to a Jenga block tower that the bottom piece is taken out and everything starts shaking and becomes unstable. And uh, that's what it felt like for my, my beliefs. And then I, I endured another, you know, 30 plus years of trying to figure that out. So uh, because I'm not, I, I enjoy thought, I enjoy theology and philosophy and things like that, but I, I, I won't be told what I have to believe. Like I, I really feel that I need to find out for myself what's true and um, that uh, I need to discover my own way of being spiritual. And for me, the freedom to be my authentic self is of utmost importance. And I translated that into uh, other people that I, I, that's what I'm very passionate about is helping people find the freedom to be their authentic selves. Mm -hmm. um, but church in my experience, even though I was a pastor of church, church in my experience pressures us all to conform to a certain standard of belief and behavior. And uh, I bucked against that all the time. And uh, because I felt it not only quenched, but could kill the human spirit's desire to be fully free. So that, that to me is, is kind of the driving force behind everything I do. I want to be free. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want others to enjoy that freedom as well in their own way. And uh, so that's why oh, it was so difficult for me to be a part of a system that isn't necessarily a, a safe place for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you feel like you were pushing those limits as a pastor, that you were encouraging freedom versus conformity and and if you were, how did your congregation respond to that? Was that something that they welcomed or or felt uncomfortable with you about? <laughs> yeah, so my own my own concept of freedom grew. You know, you never know how trapped you were until you're free. Mm -hmm. And then you think you're free, and then you realize, you know, oh, you know, you, you just stepped into a bigger box. So I I just I just realized that, you know, I, I was sort of like a, a house plant that kept getting repotted into a bigger pot and realizing. There's, there is no pot. You don't need that pot, you know, kind of thing. So uh, I, you know, I, I was pushing the limits. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. But like I said, I always gravitated towards churches that when I was applying for a church or whatever, or they were um, inviting me, I, we felt each other out and I felt, okay, I feel I can be my pretty much be myself here. And I could test the limits of my own experiments in living free and um, encouraging them to be free. Now, by the end of my ministry, though, um, I think I'd become pretty radical in what I believed freedom, personal freedom could be. Like, I really do believe that we can gather as communities, as free individuals. Um, that's the challenge, in my opinion. Um, how can I be free? while not violating your freedom and how can you be free without violating my freedom i think that's a great question to ask but i think that forms really healthy communities and uh but that kind of freedom is is scary for a lot of people i've actually had people sat down in front of my you know pastor's desk and say we pay you to tell us what to believe <laughs> mm -hmm. so you know people there there is that where people, um, they don't want to do the hard work of discovering their own truth for themselves and to figure out for themselves how to be free. Uh, it's very frightening. 
Um, you know, it's it's a scary endeavor to be free. It's like the Israelites leaving Egypt. Um, you know, mm -hmm. at least back in Egypt, we had leeks and onions, you know, and we had a safe place to lay our head. And, you know, um, yeah, we had to work hard, but at least we were safe here in the wilderness. We don't know if we're going to live or die. And, uh, you know, that's what freedom can look like often. Mm -hmm. Like Shawshank Redemption. I don't know if you've seen that, but the, the old fella who gets free and he doesn't want to be free. Yeah. He, he enjoys the securities and predictabilities and comforts of his prison life that he's been there pretty much his whole life. And so when he is set free, he decides to take his own life because he just can't figure out how to live in the real world, right? So um, it's very, very, freedom is scary, but um, that's where that's where you find your own promised land, right? You know, like that is, is by walking through that freedom and fr figuring out for yourself how to be free and how to live free and how to, you get to decide how to be spiritual. And um, like I said, for many, that's scary, but I think it's the necessary thing to enjoy a mature uh, wisdom and, and uh, spirituality. Yeah, even as you're talking, I'm getting a little bit of goosebumps because you're so good at mixing, you know, this language that we have that you may or may not have literal belief in anymore, but these metaphors, these symbologies, you know, the people, you know, who were enslaved in Egypt, the promised land, you know, like these words, right, that we're so familiar with <laughs> if you come from church culture. And I think this is why your art is so effective is that you're using these concepts, but instead of using them in kind of traditional constrictive ways, you're kind of opening up new thought, which, you know, I, I, what, you know, regardless of whether you believe in the new Testament or whether or not you believe in Jesus Christ being a savior, whatever, so much of what's written in those spaces. Um, and you focus a lot on Jesus. It's fairly revolutionary. You know, it's kind of like, you know, these thoughts of, of community pushback, acceptance, you know, love, um, mm. and that not being tied to conditions, right? I think yeah. that was in a sense, Jesus's basic message that you find in the yeah. New Testament script. That's a, a, a really astute observation. Like I, I do draw a lot of my cartoons might contain Jesus, but, uh, in my opinion, you don't have to believe in Jesus as a savior or as the Christ, or even as a historical figure, um for the cartoon to make sense right so yeah i do use analogies and metaphors and myths, myths all the time i mean i've drawn cartoons of adam and eve i don't believe they're a real historical couple um you know i've drawn pictures of uh, jonah and the whale i don't believe that's a real historical event but my goodness the the story of jonah and the whale is packed with meaning and and truth right like any mythology i mean we might talk a sisyphus um, where we, you know, endeavor to keep pushing impossible dreams up a hill and, you know, we just can't seem ever seem to achieve it, but that we don't necessarily think he was a historical figure. So um, I think I got that mythology right, right? It's just, it's just, it's just, I, I believe I, so, yes. You know, I'm thinking. <laughs> and and uh, like uh, John Bly, or anyway, the author Bly, who wrote Iron John, who took a myth and... Um, you know, analyzed it and and um, used it to uh, speak to men, um, and and I, you know, we, we're using these stories all the time to convey meaning. I mean, you know, I, I hear this happens a lot actually. In, in fact, I'm being interviewed by an atheist tomorrow night or the next night who really loves my stuff, and he gets it though. He understands that I I don't necessarily mean just because I draw a picture of Santa Claus talking with Jesus. I don't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to believe that they're actually historical figures to get the meaning of the cartoon. Yeah. All right. Yeah. There's truth in, <laughs> there's truth in experience. There's truth in the human lived kind of psyche, right. That show up in these stories, whether they're historically true or not. And, and I think that's why we find them powerful, especially if they're part of our kind of uh, language, you know, that we've grown up with. Yeah. Um, and even what you talked about with freedom, this, this tension between people wanting freedom and people wanting stability, you know, and wanting security and how those sometimes can feel juxtaposed um, in mental health land. We talk a lot about differentiation, you know, being able to be connected with somebody 
but also being able to be different enough. You don't have to be the same in order to enjoy connection. Um, yeah. That takes emotional resilience and that takes skill and that takes work and effort. And it's not easy. Sometimes it's easier to just, like you're saying, just tell me what to do. Tell me what to believe. Tell me yeah. who to be. Um, but that doesn't necessarily lead to, you know, personal growth and development. What would you say? So as you, as you sat with so many people for so many years, 30 years is a long time to sit with, you know, that space of, of, of looking and, and being amongst congregants. And I know in most religions, people come to the pastor for advice or for, with their problems, you know, you have the kind of closed door sessions with people as well. What would you say were the pain points? What, what were the things that you were noticing uh, were either, you know, ideas that were maybe not offering more open-mindedness or things that were keeping people kind of in what I call unnecessary tragedy, right? Like I feel like there's so much unnecessary tragedy when we believe certain things that keep us contained instead of opening ourselves up to our gay child or opening ourselves up to more mm -hmm. feminist ideas or how would you talk about that experience? Mm -hmm. uh, first though, I, I actually wrote a book about relationships and the whole differentiation thing um, till doubt do us part when changing beliefs change your marriage because that's a huge, huge issue that I've been noticing when people start questioning their beliefs or deconstructing or whatever, leaving the church uh, and they're in a marriage or a relationship of some kind that uh, it can go through real trauma and um, people have a really hard time going through it. So I, I shared my own story in there when, when I left the ministry in 2010, Lisa and I went through a really, really difficult few years of trying to figure out how to renegotiate our relationship because we were really 100% totally devoted and involved with the church. I mean, it was like a ghettoized existence of, of our whole community, our whole support, all our friends, my income, our housing, you know, everything, our, our activities was all wrapped up in the church. And um, so uh, it, it can be really traumatizing to when you're in a relationship and, and changing your beliefs. So I talk about that quite a bit. Uh, the biggest pain point when people are, are leaving the church is loneliness. And I sort of reverse engineer that to a lot of the time, a lot of what I was talking with people about was relationships. So it's it's kind of an interesting um, thing that everything seems to point back. How do I how do I live in this world with other people? You know, basically, <laughs> how do I be me with other people? Um, how do I how can I be authentic with other people without being rejected or expelled or excommunicated or you know um uh anything like that you know it's it's i, I think that's what i i did a lot of my one-on-ones was one-on-ones with and couples with uh that issue um was relationships yeah yeah it's mixed faith mixed faith family mixed faith marriage is yeah. really, really difficult. And as more and more people are shifting their beliefs and their ideas of whether or not they want to be involved with organized religion, you have a lot of people where, yeah, it's like, well, I'm headed this way, but I'm married to a person who's staying over here. And the sense of betrayal that that can feel like for the more believing person, like, hey, I, I signed up with you under this agreement that we were going to be spiritual and religious and we're going to follow this tradition Right, changing the contract, <laughs> and not only does that affect us, but how it affects how we're going to parent our children, and how we're going to deal with our in-laws, and how we're going to be friends with our people. Right, so yeah, we we lack differentiation skills, and especially high demand religions, because we see we see people who are not of us kind of as dangerous. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Like, yeah. why is it we like we we other people so much in the sense of. Yeah. So Lisa and I, uh, in May, we'll, we will have been married 43 years. And wow. we were very young when we got married. Um, she was 19. I was 21. And, um, you know, we were joined at the hip. Like we met at a Bible college and then we just were together the same all the way through 
not only on the same page, we're on the same line, you know what I mean? So it's like <laughs> very, and, and in the ministry together, uh, working together um, with churches and with families, our three kids grew up in the church and it was all, all very much insular, you know? Um, but we were constantly, um, you know, consuming books on relationships and on marriage and we were going to marriage retreats we were going to, oh, what's the Roman Catholic one? Um, not Curcio, um, Marriage Encounter, uh, yeah. di different, and, and just like constantly working on our relationship, going to counseling, um, getting therapy together, um, and really, really working hard. But when we, uh, when we left the ministry in 2010, our beliefs had already been deconstructing. Our beliefs had already been changing. That was challenging enough. But when we left the church, that's when it became very, very apparent that we were now, you know, on not on the same line, not on the same page, not on this in the same book. Were we even in the same library? <laughs> right. Very, very scary. And uh, we we had to really work hard and and took a couple of years to figure out how to be in relationship and because I think we assumed the glue to our relationship was doing everything together and compatibility of beliefs and all that kind of thing and um, but after we did the hard work we realized what really was holding us together the real glue is love and mutual respect. Mm so that I love the believer, not the beliefs, you know what I mean? The I love the thinker, not the thoughts. Um, I loved her and in all of her manifestations. And, and then she loved me in all of my manifestations, you know, mm -hmm. uh, whatever they might be. So that's where we decided to renegotiate and re-sign our contract, metaphorically speaking, and uh, figure out how to move forward. And our marriage has never been better. But we had to learn how to differentiate. Like we had been uh, in, in psychological term, pretty entangled. We, we enjoyed it though. It was, mm. we loved it. Um, yeah. And uh, very, you know, a lot of romance and all that kind of thing. But when we had to differentiate, it was, it was ripping and tearing. It was really, really hard work. I, I just read the other day, actually, one of the most important books in, that we read was by David Schnark, Passionate Marriage. Yes. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I just discovered yesterday he died in 1920. I didn't, or uh, 2020. Yeah. I didn't know that. Um, it yes. sort of threw me away right at the beginning of COVID. So, um, but that was one of the big books that helped us realize that when you enter into a relationship like that and you're serious about it, you're entering a crucible where, you know, if one changes, the other must change um and or else it's going to put strain on the relationship and maybe even fracture it so um that's what i talk a lot about now um with individuals and with others and that's what i talked a lot with people in the congregation and also with the congregation like my instagram account for example very diverse people there and everything from church going believers and pastors to jews to buddhists to atheists um, and because for me, this is how the world ought to look. This is how relationships ought to look is differentiated and diverse. And I really do believe that we can enjoy unity in diversity. And um, I've seen it. I'm seeing it in our leases of my relationship in our with our kids, um, with the last church I pastored, um, and that you can have a wide diversity of people and and still enjoy one another and enjoy community and mm -hmm. uh, so i've seen it work in real life i see it work online and uh that's what i i talk i end up talking a lot about because uh, i think that's the biggest pain point for a lot of people is figuring out how to be authentic while appreciate appreciating the authenticity of others i love that yeah, I think enmeshment or entanglement, like you said, yes. it's kind of like this idea that you, yeah, it feels really good because you're kind of married to a, another version of yourself. And who doesn't want to be married to yourself? <laughs> right? 
It's like yeah. super easy. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I usually talk about how that, I don't really count that as intimacy. I think that sameness, you know, it's, it's sameness and it's easy to be the same. I think when you really reach intimacy, it's, it's this other thing that we've been talking about is being able to see somebody being able to accept and respect differences that may feel really jarring and may feel really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And how do we self soothe that part of us that isn't the same now with another person, whether that's your kid, whether that's your spouse, yeah. whether it's your best friend, you know, and I think yeah. also this unrealistic expectation that when you get married, Oh, we're just going to face the problems of the world together. We're always going to be the same. I yeah. wish that we taught more in premarital kind of spaces that you're, you're going to change. This person is going to change. That's, you can't spend 50 years with somebody, 60 years with somebody and not expect some pretty significant changes along the way. Mm. Um, so yeah. that you're not as surprised, right? When you're like, wait, you changed a thought, <laughs> you changed a belief. <laughs> How could that be? <laughs> so. yeah, you know, it's it's one thing to change your favorite color or to change your favorite meal or to, you know, change the kind of art you like or the kind of music you like or the kind of books you read or change your friends once in a while or your vehicle or anything. But changing beliefs is, you know, it's kind of existential. And, um, you know, I think that's where a lot of people really freak out. Well, we do. We do freak out when there's uh, this um, changing of beliefs. So um, I, I, I share a lot of that in my book, um, you know, giving a little bit of advice on, it's also got cartoons too, but uh, gives advice on how to navigate those kind of treacherous waters um, of uh, when, when you, because you need to sort of provide, you want to provide a, a safe place for your partner to be authentic and to raise their questions or, you know, thoughts. But um, you also need to sort of be prepared for that and um, be prepared to get stretched, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree. Well, so my first kind of exposure to you were cartoons with rainbow sheep. Oh, uh, yeah. Right? So, yeah, that was the first yeah. thing I saw <laughs> was, uh, you know, these these very simple yet very profound, you know, cartoons where some there was some form of ostracization that was happening and 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 maybe we, sometimes it was even the black sheep you know so and, and we have all this sheep metaphors right in christianity that you go after the one sheep and um mm -hmm. although it's interesting that most of us don't practice that because then we get grumpy when jesus is off meddling with the last sheep right and so this kind of comes across <laughs> in your cartoons um yeah. so can you tell me a little bit about what where where did you start like in your kind of artistic expression what themes were you kind of interested in and and how did you get so um involved especially with supporting kind of uh gay homosexual lesbian trans folks you know you have now quite a few blue and pink and white sheep so um yeah tell us about that journey well i um i don't ever remember thinking, um, you know, the LGBTQ plus folk are going to hell or anything. I never, ever remember thinking that. Like for me, one of the earliest problems I experienced was um, somebody I love very much, a friend who uh, was a believer and whose family went through a horrible, uh, her mom and dad went through a horrible divorce and it was just terrible and broke up the family and this was when I was quite young and them um, feeling really angry and, and at God. And even if there was a God like that, it had that much of a devastation on their faith and everything. And I, I, I remember thinking to myself, well, I, why would I blame her for feeling that way? Like what, why, if she's questioning the existence of God and, that God doesn't love us and doesn't help us and rescue us or fix things for us. Why, why would I throw somebody like that in hell? Like that just doesn't make sense to me. And I was quite young when I thought that way. And, and so when I encountered um, gay people or 
had a gay friend, or um, I remember many, many, many years ago when I was a young man meeting a trans woman. And, um, you know, when they found out I was uh, uh, in the ministry, this was way back in my 20s, they sort of shared where they were at and and all and how they experienced rejection from their family and friends and job and church and everything. And I thought, why? I, I It didn't make sense to me. So um, when I, uh, like I've been, I've been drawing and painting my whole life because my dad was an artist in the side. And uh, so I've been around art all the time and I, I draw ever since I can remember. Um, but when I first started blogging in 2005, I would share a painting or something like that. But in 2006, I thought, why don't I try draw a cartoon? Up to that point, Naked Pastor, I was writing blog posts like so many pastors did. And um, I thought, why don't I try drawing a cartoon and see, see what happens? I, I'm going to draw one every day until I run out of ideas. And I thought I might last a couple of weeks. And so here we are. <laughs> <laughs> 18 years later, and I'm still drawing cartoons, and um, they just took off, and uh, I don't know. Um, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. I love a really good cartoon. I try to draw them in one frame. Uh, you see it, and you get it in less than a second. Um, it's fast. It's effective. It bypasses your intellect, your defenses, goes straight for your heart. And uh, I love, I just love the power of that. And, 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 and so when I was in the ministry, um, I, it became very clear to me when I was in the church that there's this very strong sense of who's in and who's out um, and that you need to come and join us in order to belong and, you know, uh, get your ticket to heaven or whatever. And um, it, I, I would just start drawing about that, that trying to figure out how to, convey, illustrate, there is no in and there is no out. There is no line between the sacred and secular, um, you know, heavenly and earthly and, you know, the flesh and spirit. There is no line and um, that we're, we're all in. And uh, so I, I would try to draw and convey those kind of messages. And um, it seems to me that the church in many ways uh, not all churches, I'm talking about the church in general, generally speaking, seems to have drawn a line in the sand where this is where we draw the line is LGBTQ people or trans people. Now, I live in Canada. Our laws are different up here than where you are. Um, and, um, you know, uh, it's the law up here that trans and LGBTQ, et cetera, people have full rights um, and, and freedoms as anyone else. Uh, so I just try to draw that. I try, I try to challenge the church. On the one hand, I'm trying to encourage LGBTQIA plus people. And on the other hand, I'm trying to challenge those who are trying to discourage them. <laughs> so that's that seems to be what I'm I'm doing with, with my art. I just read a book. Um, uh, by Johan Harry called Stolen Focus. And he's talking about the effect the internet's had on our ability to think and deeply and to focus and so on. And in there, he shares some research that people who um, read fiction tend to be more empathetic because in fiction, you kind of enter into the mind and life of another person and you you kind of walk in their shoes for a while and you form empathy. I thought that was really interesting. And I thought, I'm hoping I achieve that with my cartoons so that when somebody sees uh, um, um, a rainbow sheep or a trans sheep being rejected because of who they are, that they might feel some pain there. Or if they see a, a trans sheep or a rainbow sheep being accepted and loved unconditionally, um, and given full access and full rights and full responsibilities and everything that they might empathize with that. So that that's uh, that's why I cartoon. I yeah. love it. I love it. What other themes do you feel like you you you? I mean, I've seen cartoons of like you said, couples, sexuality, feminism. Yes. 
what what are some of the themes that we need challenging on kind of like you're saying we need inclusivity but we also need to kind of challenge some of these spaces that are right. really having some double down pushback on yeah the human progress experience <laughs> well yeah you must deal with a lot of people who've grown up in purity culture and and so on and um so i i address that quite a bit um i've noticed people really like my sexy cartoons <laughs> Like I'll draw a couple in bed and everything. Everything's discreet, right? There's blankets and pillows and everything in the right places. But, um, you know, they'll say something and um, that challenges the purity culture or whatever. Um, and people just really love those cartoons. So I think I'm going to do one every every Sunday and, um, you know, uh, and just see what happens. I might come up with a book of them, actually, that challenge the whole purity culture thing and and sexuality and so on but uh, i'm having fun with those they're a lot of fun but um you know what my number one most offensive cartoons are my feminist cartoons women interesting yeah yeah I, I don't like say elevate women because it sounds like i'm centering myself and elevating women what i mean is recognize their power um that's what i mean and uh and and that this power ought to be just as much displayed in the church as anywhere um and in relationships and marriages and in the presence of men and everything man oh man do i ever get kicked back on those ones it's it's kind of surprising um i thought my lgbtq cartoons would be the most offensive but i think for uh conservative fundamentalist kind of believers the lgbtq they can just write me off as a heretic because that's obviously sinful but when you um show an empowered woman i think that's considered dangerous for some reason um because there's a lot of you <laughs> there's a yeah. lot yeah and, and we're, in, we're in relationship with women and every really you know like yeah they're you, everywhere you may not know that you're in a relationship with an lgbtqi plus, two plus person but you are definitely in relationship with people who own vaginas yes mm -hmm. so yeah that's interesting or when i challenge the uh, inspiration of scripture and things like that these are the most offensive uh, cartoons yeah yeah well and, and at some i guess at some point that makes sense because you're challenging the the line of authority both in the divinity and also in the priesthood and where power comes from and who gets to decide what is correct and what isn't. And so yes. if you're going to mess with that, then that's pretty much at the core of everything. Yeah. Yeah. I th that, that's why I say, I think the LGBTQ cartoons, um, they just say, obviously the scripture says that's an abomination. So you're a heretic and that's it. But when you um, uh, reveal an empowered woman um that's dangerous because of the numbers and and because uh, there's empowered women in the bible and um it's a um obviously uh there are scriptures that even though you might bend over backwards to try to reinterpret them i think um are obviously written from a culture that was patriarchal and uh i think if we most people are starting to see through that now. So yeah, I, I think it's I think it's pretty interesting. But like I said, it's like um, um, seeing a cartoon, hopefully um, it might shatter a barrier, you know, in somebody's mind or heart and uh, might soften somebody or or help somebody see the foolishness of misogyny or homophobia or transphobia or Islamophobia or whatever phobia, you know, and uh, maybe soften up their hearts a bit to um, love everyone. Yeah, yeah. Mm. One of the recent cartoons I just saw you do, well, I don't know if it's recent, just because I see them doesn't mean that they're recent, <laughs> uh, was one where you have PTSD is kind of like a gift that is being opened as a person is leaving religion. And I just finished a podcast with Marlene Winnell, Dr. Marlene Winnell, who is the person who coined religious trauma syndrome back in the 90s. So tell me kind of your experience. Why are you comfortable using that term? I, I think, again, a lot of people might think like, 
trauma from the church. Come on, like the church is this loving, wonderful place. Why, why are you comfortable, like kind of making that cartoon? Well, because I've been spiritually, spiritually abused in my life horribly. Like I've got, I got hair raising stories that happened in the church. It's hard to believe, but it, it's true. It's not hard to believe. A lot yeah, of people. Not- <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And uh, it's, you know, spiritual abuse, Abuse happens in institutions. The dehum. I, I, I really. My, my, um, I, my default position is that all institutions, the gravitational pull is towards the dehumanization of its members. It's mm-hmm. just every every institution. It's just that's the gravitational pull is towards managing people and the easiest way to manage people is to remove their humanity or neglect their humanity or dismiss it and and so that's why um i believe all institutions and people who work within them need to be very intentional about working against that and that's the full-time job in my opinion and uh churches though uh, have the extra ingredient of god it divinizes it. It gives it spiritual authority, um, heavenly sanction, you know, to to manage the people and control them and coerce and manipulate and whatever. Uh, that often turns into spiritual abuse. So I've experienced that um, on a personal level and on a systemic level. And I've participated in the church as a pastor in the systemic aspect of spiritual abuse you know uh it it's that and that's why i struggled so much with it uh with the ministry is uh, the system just i don't know it it just invites it 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 reminds me of a, a very powerful book i read um it's called the lucifer effect um and he he was a uh, his name starts with a z Anyway, he was a professor at Stanford, and he did that experiment of the prison in the basement of Stan- one of the Stanford um, halls, yeah. and yeah. some students were hired to be the prisoners, and some students were hired to be the guards, and all good people, all healthy people, everything was fine, and within days, not even a weekend, I don't think, it degraded into a very abusive so they had to shut down the experiment it had gotten so bad so quickly and so now he's now an expert witness on such he became an expert witness on like the abu Ghraib cases where perfectly healthy sane um kind devoted soldiers uh, became abusers of prisoners on a horrific level and it just goes to show that good people in um really negative environments can become bad people do bad things i should correct that not bad people do bad things and so that's what happens in the church is that the systemic pressure to participate in that spirit of control over people is so hard to resist and i think that should be all pastors and leaders full-time job is to resist that yeah i looked it up for you it's philip zimbardo Zimbardo. uh, the lucifer effect understanding how good people turn evil yeah we studied that you know in psych 101 basically right that um that that study and how how it's difficult that we and and none of us are immune to this none of us none of us are immune i i i try to remind you know remind people who do leave religion and it, it can be very easy to be judgmental, of course, towards the people, and the places you come from, but we are just as, you know, subject to group think and group dynamics, whether you're in or out of religion. But I agree with you that there's an extra component in adding that divine authority, because that's something that really can't be trumped, right? So, and why I think spiritual abuse is so easy to happen, because I mean, just you and me and we're two people and well you're a person and I'm a person and and maybe there are some power dynamics if you're a white man or I'm a you know brown woman or you know there, there can be some power dynamics but when you add God it's kind of like the conversation ends 
There's no, well, God said it. Sorry. I didn't mean to be a misogynist, but God said it. (laughs) It's kind of like, it's kind of like uh, the divine right of Kings, which is a thing. Uh, The divine right of pastors is the same, same thing uh, where uh, I, and and this is what's so um, a mind F. I don't know if you can use that word, but where it really really works with your mind, where we all participated in it. We were all complicit in, and where uh, abuse was divinely allowed and permitted and even commanded, some believe. And so the perpetrator believes that, but also we who are being abused kind of believe it too. Mm-hmm. And it and, and makes for a very, very toxic uh, situation that can descend into cult-like craziness pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, as you're talking about the purity culture, I mean, I've been calling that sexual spiritual abuse for a long time because it's not just the touching of another person's body in a non-consensual way that should be considered sexual abuse. It's all these ideas of what you tell people, who they are, what they're about, what they're allowed to or not allowed to do, whether or not you're worthy or unworthy, those really have huge psychological impacts on people's lives and the choices. Like, they. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like when I, uh, I've been doing some cartoons lately on the purity culture and um, last week I did one where there's a couple in bed making out and um, I had on the top fun things to do instead of church on Sunday morning. <laughs> and um I had so many people reach out to me saying that they they still they've been married for years and she still for example a woman she still cries when she has sex because she just feels so dirty mm-hmm. and because of what she was taught you know it so that kind of uh yeah that's that's on the level of abuse when mm-hmm. you um brainwash somebody to the point where they can't enjoy their own bodies anymore is pretty serious. Mm-hmm. Right. Even something as simple as masturbation, being able to touch your own body, that's been cinephized, right? By many, many um, religious communities. Do you think about that? Yeah, that's my word. Do you I like, like that? Cinephied. <laughs> yeah. If you use it in a cartoon, I'd be like, I... <laughs> <laughs> That's a good word, cinified. That's my favorite word. We cinifies all kinds of stuff. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but yeah, you think about that, right? Like whether or not I can touch my own body and whether or not I can think about something. So you now are in my brain and you're in my body about some really personal things. Like there's just no boundaries. So boundaries. the harm of that, yeah, is super, super. Why naked pastor? Yeah. You know, um, I, it it all happened quite by accident where I had my blog and it was something like churchpundit.com. And I, you know, kind of, kind of heady. So instead of political pundit, it was church pundit. But I I was looking around for a different name and I, I thought naked pastor, because at that time, the naked chef, the naked archaeologist, the naked truth, they were kind of cool at that time. And uh, I thought the naked pastor, because I wanted people to see behind the curtain of what really goes on in the ministry and the church. And because there, there's a lot of pastor bloggers out there, but I wanted to be really, really real and raw mm-hmm. and unadorned and just let it all hang out and tell it like it was. So that's where the naked comes from. Is As you can see, I'm fully dressed um, <laughs> and uh, I'm very modest. I'm, I'm quite <laughs> modest. and. Uh, uh, but uh, I just, you're not the nudist pastor, but you are the naked uh, pastor. No, I'm not the nudist pastor. <laughs> but well, I am sometimes. <laughs> but uh, when it's appropriate. But um, it's it's um, you know it's it. When people come to my page, that I hope that one of the first things they pick up is that I'm I'm honest. Mm, yeah, that you're being authentic with what you're presenting, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, which 
me being honest and being authentic, which I've I said earlier is my number one passion is to be free to be my authentic self. Hopefully people get inspired to do the same thing and yeah. be their authentic selves. Yeah. In your mind, is is the church redeemable? What's what's it gonna take for the church? And I know you've talked about the church like with a big C, and I think there's lots of churches out yeah. there. Yeah. What what is is there any way that the that the sheeps can all be <laughs> regardless of the color they come in, that, that we well, can like, contemplate? Yeah, like I so some people think I'm an enemy of the church. I hate the church, I'm attacking the church. Not true. I care about the church. I mean, the church is my mother, my spiritual mother. That's I grew up in her arms and everything. My goodness, she's con controlling mother. <laughs> and I had to leave home. And I, it, she's horrible to live with. But mm -hmm. uh, I still love the church in many ways. But uh, and and you know, I don't know whether you want to say the church it is just has a survival instinct or is like a cockroach. I don't know which one you want to choose, but it'll, it'll continue to, to survive. And I think it's here with us to stay. Yeah. Uh, you can't stamp it out. Um, the church just has a remarkable ability to survive persecution. Uh, it'll go underground. It, it will always be with us. So that's why I continually challenge the church. Can let's do it. But can we please do it in a healthy manner? That's all I ask. I don't care about the bells and whistles and the incense and the cathedrals and the temples and the robes and offerings and buildings and staff and ordinate. I don't care. All that's just style. To me, the, what matters is when we gather people together, can we please do it in a healthy manner? And, and if a church... Um, takes up that challenge, that's the kind of church I would go to. Um, but most churches don't want to take up that challenge because it it uh, it would be the end of church as they know it. So, um, you know, yeah. I've seen it work locally in real church. There are some churches like that out there. They're rare. Uh, if you can find one, go. Don't care about the style. Don't if the lousy sermons are, are not very inspiring, or you know the choir sucks, or you know the sound system's no good, or the carpet's ugly, or well, I don't. All that doesn't matter. If you can get together with other people and it's not toxic, but is actually functional and healthy, that's mm -hmm. that's a church community worth staying for. Wow. But it's so rare. Wow. Yeah, right. And then mm -hmm. I think the challenge other people are having are how to create those communities in secular worlds, you know, so wherever, you know, wherever anybody congregates in ways that you're describing can be a space of health. And yet, unfortunately, I think sometimes the guilt, the guilty mother is more successful at gathering her chicks than people who are more like just, oh, let's gather on a regular basis, just on our own, or on, on our own whim, you know. Yeah, well, the system's in place. Like, yeah. uh when I left the church, I did try other things. I tried other clubs or groups or whatever, but nothing matches what the church can yeah. offer. And so yeah. you're, it's just like, uh, you know, it's it's going back to Egypt or whatever, um, yeah. or going back home, you know. Uh, but man, I, I, uh, I really think it can be done. I experimented with it here locally with the church, and it was great. Um, I experiment with it online um, and trying to help create a safe space for you to be your authentic self and for us to function together online as a community. Um, but yeah, I've seen it in other um, kinds of groups where they've tried to come up with an alternative to church or whatever, even in the atheist community, and they a lot of them just blow up and explode because of the same issues that the church faces, uh, like competition and control and relegating and, you know, trying to get people to conform and, and everything. So it is, it's difficult. It's a human problem. It's a human problem. Uh, right. if, if humans would face it and really take up that challenge, um, it would, I think we'd see more of these communities pop up. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even as a business owner myself, and you know, it's a challenge even in that world too. So um, yeah. yeah. Well, is there anything I haven't asked? I know we're coming to the end of the time. Is there anything that you were just burning to tell me that I haven't really asked you about or any last, I guess, thoughts as we wrap up? No, no, it's it's been great. I've enjoyed talking with you. It's been a lot of fun. Has anybody on uh, Facebook asked any questions or anything? Or there hasn't been any questions. There's been a few comments. They're like, oh, my favorite people. And they kind of laughed about Cinefy. <laughs> so there were things like that. So, but you know, once we posted, there may be more questions in the comments as far as the the official page, you know, where the podcast is. Can you share with us a little bit? So where do people find you? You sell beautiful art, not just comics, but you do watercolors. And so tell us a little bit about how we can help like just build you up and edify the work that you're doing. So one of the one of the big things for me and me being my authentic self is is creativity and just um, you know, so I'm painting some paintings behind me um uh paintings i'm doing drawing my cartoons i'm writing books here let me just get one here uh oh i can't find it well here it is um i'm writing books and this is the latest one i've come up with is uh flip it like this and oh, i love that one. that's my new uh best of cartoon book so i'm having a lot of fun with that um i'm also uh on youtube um, my instagram follow me there i'm really good at responding to email um i have an online community called the lasting supper i've got courses and you know all that kind of thing so i'm very very busy but the home base is nakedpastor.com and from there you can find all my other stuff but okay. uh, yeah it's cool um like did you, uh, did you, did we meet first in Salt Lake City or did you reach out to me first saying that we were going to meet there? No, I think we met first. In yeah. Salt Lake so City. that's cool. See, that to me is what can happen is I met you out of the blue, Salt Lake City, and uh, we connected and was wonderful meeting you. And here we are talking, having a conversation and your people are behind you somewhere. Um, we're all participating together. See, this is what I think can happen, right? And your background and my background are very, very different. But um, we can totally meet um, as different people and have a great yeah. conversation, right? So yeah. and if you feel yeah. any pressure from you to believe in what you believe, and I hope you don't feel any pressure from me. And I think this is the way the uh, really healthy world can operate. Yes, I agree. No, I, I had to kind of get, I had to rev up my, 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 my courage to go say hello to you. Plus I didn't want to bother you too much. There was a lot of people who wanted to talk to you. I'm super glad I did. Yeah. And you we're very gracious. And for those of you who couldn't see the, the, he said the flip it book, it's the, his cartoon where Jesus is flipping tables, which was like one of my favorite stories in the scripture. <laughs> it's like, first of all, just because, well, that's kind of my personality. I flip tables. And second of all, it's one of those stories that really offers val validity to anger, righteous anger mm -hmm. and information, which is, I think a lot of what has been underlying our conversation today, right. Is when people when something's awry, when something's unjust, when something isn't fair, when you're feeling isolated or ostracized, there's this anger that comes from pain and confusion and betrayal. And it, and it is, it's a righteous anger. And I love that there's a, there's a biblical story with God himself <laughs> flipping yeah. the freaking table. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I always like to clarify about that cartoon that in my opinion, that's a Jesus as a Jewish prophet, not a Christian, uh, you know, leader kind of thing. So for me, that's a very Jewish story in the line yes. of, the, of the Old Testament prophets, uh, Jesus as a prophet. Um, I don't see it as Jesus as a Christian um, upset with the Jewish forms of worship or temple or anything like that. But I just want to make that clear. To me, it's a very um, Jewish story. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, just being angry with hypocrisy and and using, you know, kind of divine things for not divine purposes. So, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. And Tyler Kayser says, I love the work and the message of both of you. I have loved sharing the artwork of the naked pastor on my social media. He effectively communicates with his art, how I feel about LGBTQ plus issues. So there you go. There's a comment. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, for so your when, you, when you Google naked pastor, uh, make sure you use one word, not two words, because if you Google naked pastor, you're going to see things that will surprise you. Maybe well, it might be more in the sexual media <laughs> format. Yeah. Yeah, so naked pastor, one word, but I'm that's my name across all social media. And uh, I, if you reach out, I promise I'll respond. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. I have loved uh, sharing your energy today, and uh, I hope our paths cross again sometime soon. Ditto. Thank you so much. All right. Take care of yourself. Thank bye you. bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Natasha Helfer Podcast. To help keep this podcast going, please consider donating at natashahelfer.com and share this episode. You can find Natasha on Facebook at Natasha Helfer, LCMFT, CSTS, and at Natasha Helfer MFT on Instagram and TikTok. You can find all her cool resources at natashahelfer.com. The intro and outro music for this episode is by Otter Creek. This podcast was edited by Ashley Pacini. There is a place where Time slows to nature's pace, and there is space there to find yourself in her embrace. Some places should be left alone. the homeland of the heart Ten thousand years of our human history etched on Earth's mysteries Some places should be left alone So we can always go To the homeland of the heart To the homeland of the heart the home